Deidre Buckley. I'm with the MEPA office, which is the Massachusetts Environmental Policy Act office, and I'm representing the Secretary of Environmental Affairs, Robert Gollidge. I'm going to give you just a quick overview of the, how the process is going to work tonight, and um, then we'll go ahead and get started. So what I'm going to do first is just do a quick introduction on the MEPA process, what it is, why we're having the meeting, what the purpose of this review is. And all of the information I'm going to give you is available on our website, so I'll go ahead and give you that reference now so you have it if you want to look something up. We also have a sign-in sheet um, on the table in the entrance to the auditorium, as well as a um, two-page overview of the MEPA process and information on submitting public comments. So if you haven't already picked that up, you can pick it up on your way out. And like I said, you can also get it on our website which is www.mass.gov slash E-N-V-I-R as an environment, and then you click on the MEPA office. Again, that's www.mass.gov slash E-N-V-I-R. So I'm going to give an overview of the MEPA process. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mayor Curratone to provide some introductory remarks. I also want to thank you for making the auditorium available and uh, helping us staff this tonight and make sure that there's audio-visual equipment and everything available. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over to the MBTA for their presentation. They'll give a fairly quick overview of what the project is, um, what their planning process has been to date, what, the impact, what alternatives they've looked at in terms of planning this project out, what the potential impacts are of those alternatives, and um, then we'll open it up for comment. And basically, because we do have a large crowd tonight, we're probably going to have to minimize comments, um, which I really hate to do, but um, we will try and ask people to keep their comments somewhat short. And we may have to minimize the amount of back and forth and actual response to questions and concerns, which I also dislike to do, but I want to make sure that everyone who's here tonight actually has an opportunity to provide their comments. So we'll see how that goes. Um, if the crowd doesn't get too big and the questions are manageable, hopefully we'll have an opportunity for some of that back and forth. So to, to kick it off, I just want to talk about um, MEPA for those of you who aren't familiar with it. And for those of you who are, I apologize because you've probably heard this speech a million times. Um, but like I said, it's the Massachusetts Environmental Policy Act office. Basically, it's an environmental review process. Um, we're not a permitting agency and we're not a regulatory authority. It is an environmental review process. Projects that require some kind of state agency funding whether that's in the form of licensing, funding, or permitting, um, and exceed certain environmental thresholds that are laid out in our regulations, need to file with MEPA. So there's kind of those two tests. You need to exceed a threshold, and then you, there's some kind of state agency action. Um, and if that's the case, then you need to file what's called an environmental notification form with MEPA. And that's where we are in this, in this process. Um, for this particular project, um, the project exceeds something called a mandatory EIR threshold. There are certain projects whose impacts we know we're going to want to review because at the, at the ENF stage or the environmental notification form stage, basically what the secretary is looking at is does this project require further review or not prior to going to permitting. So the ENF gives us kind of an overview of what the project is, what its impacts are, and at that point we're saying, all right, do we need to do additional study of this issue? or can it go forward to permitting? Once MEPA review is concluded, that doesn't mean the project is approved or denied. It means that it can go to our permitting agencies or can go get its funding or any other actions that are required by the state. Um, in this instance, and then if a project, if we determine that a project does require additional review in the form of an environmental impact report, we would lay out what the issues are, what alternatives should be studied, um, what the environmental impacts of concern are, and how those should be addressed. And basically, we, we lay, lay that out in what's called the scope for the EIR. Um, with this project, ex it exceeds, like I said, a mandatory EIR threshold. Um, the project requires, it, it's going to alter more than 50 acres of land, and it's a transit project, an expanded transit line. So that basically means that we know for this project we're going to be doing an EIR. It's a question of what is the scope of that review going to look like. So it makes this meeting a little bit easier for me because usually people are arguing, you need to study it more, you know, you definitely need to study it more, here are all the issues, but in this instance we know there's going to be an EIR. There's going to be additional review of this project through the MEPA process. So like I said, it's really an issue of what is that review going to look like. 
Um, also, in this instance, the T has filed what's called an expanded environmental notification form. And I'm sorry for all the, you know, bureaucratic speak, but that's what it's called. And they've requested what's called a single EIR. Generally, there's a two-step process when you determine a project needs additional review. There's a draft EIR that gets reviewed by MEPA and is also open to public comment. And then it, we issue a scope on that document. And then there's a final EIR, which is also subject to a comment period and um, gets reviewed by MEPA and a, a certificate is issued on that project as well. In this instance, the MBTA has filed an expanded ENF with a request that we allow them to file what's called a single EIR. And what that does basically, it provides a streamlined process and the benefit of that is that we get a lot more information or the intention is that we get a lot more information about the project, about what alternatives have been reviewed, about what the environmental impacts are and what proposed mitigation is at the start. So you kind of front load that process through the expanded ENF. So we'll be looking for comments um, from people tonight, not only on what the scope of the EIR should be, but whether or not it's appropriate to grant what's called a single EIR. <clears throat> Excuse me. So basically, um, if we grant a single EIR, what that means is instead of filing a draft and a final, EIR, there would be one document that's filed, there'll be a 30-day comment period on that document, and then the secretary would issue a certificate indicating whether or not that document adequately responded to the scope. Just wanted to go over some of the details. Um, like I mentioned before, this is an environmental review process and it's a very public process. The heart of the MEPA process is really about the public process. Um, we really encourage comments not only from our state agencies, but also from municipalities, from individuals, from advocacy groups, from organizations. Um, tonight we're having a public meeting. A lot of people might think this is actually a public hearing and goes into the public record, but that's not the case. This is a public meeting. It's somewhat informal, even though it feels formal to me. And um, while I'll listen to what everyone has to say, and I'll certainly take it into consideration, the way to get your comments in the public record is to provide written comments. And as I mentioned before, we have information on how to do that in the back. You want to make sure that you reference the project number, which is 13886, and you want to make sure you get your comments in by the, the deadline which I believe is November 9th. Let me check that. Yeah, it's November 9th. So again, the project number is 13886, and the deadline is November 9th. Um, and basically what will happen after tonight's meeting and after getting all the public comments, we'll make recommendations to the secretary about what the scope of the certificate, what the scope of the review should be, what environmental issues need to be studied, um, what environmental impacts are presented by this project, and then we'll also indicate whether or not a single EIR is appropriate in this case. Um, I know there are a lot of people here tonight who are going to have a lot of comments, um, and I know that there are issues that may go beyond this specific project. Um, I tend to not want to shut those down, but I do want to let you know that what's most useful to me as a reviewer is to hear from you about this project, its impacts, um, the concerns you have about it, what alternatives you think need to be studied or haven't been studied enough, or which one should be per pursued, and whether or not you think it's appropriate to grant a single. I know other issues are going to come up, um, and that's fine. You can do what you want with your time, but just remember that for me, that's really why I'm here and what I need to hear about. Um, we probably will limit comments to about three minutes each, to each individual. I think what I'll do is just kind of raise my hand to give people a clue that it's been about three minutes and ask you to wrap it up. Um, I also want to note that generally with my meetings, we don't do a sign-in sheet for speaking. Everyone is um, invited to speak and generally we just call on people, people line up. I know a lot of people here tonight were expecting or thought that they, they had signed in and they were on a list to speak in that order, so I apologize to any of you who we're confused by that. Um, we do have a list that we started. We will use that. And then I will open it up for anyone else who wants to make comments. So if your name is not on the list, don't worry about it. We'll make sure we get to you. And although we're putting a time frame on the comments, um, I'll stay here as long as I need to to hear from you. So I hope people aren't too concerned about that. Um, I also wanted to note, to note that I'd heard there was some concern about the meeting only being in Somerville. And I can understand that. Unfortunately, our staff tends to be kind of um, 
on the, uh, well, we don't have that much staff, so it's tough for us to do a meeting in every community. Um, it's nice when we can do it, but generally we really can't. So we chose a location that was central, and I hope that people have been able to get here, and I guess I'll just reiterate that in order to get your comments on the record, you know, we rely on the written comments, not on comments that are made here tonight. So again, while they're important, and I'll listen, I hope people aren't concerned that they, you know, did not get to speak tonight or couldn't make it to the meeting. Um, I think with that, I will turn it over to the mayor to provide some introductory remarks. And if people have any questions about the process, feel free to um, ask me after the meeting. Thank you. Well, good evening. Thanks for coming out. And uh, there are a lot more people filing in, I'm sure, filing in throughout the night. I want to first just welcome some people here. Uh, Deirdre Buckley, obviously representing uh, uh, Robert Gulledge from the Office of Environmental Affairs from EOEA, uh, from the Executive Office of, Trans uh, Executive Office of Transportation uh, Planning, David Moeller, Steve Werfel, their consultants, Trans Systems. I want to recognize, uh, first of all, anybody hear me okay? Yep. Need to something about the mic system here. I want to recognize the uh, elected officials in the room. Uh, Representative Jim Marzilli, uh, Representative Kyle Shortino. You can applaud. They're good. They're good people. <laughs> applaud. <laughs> uh, so I know Senator Pat Jandler. She's not already here. She's on her way. Her chief of staff, David Jordan, is here. Uh, Representative Denise Provo. The um, representing the mayor of Medford, Michael McGlynn, from the direct uh, the director of community development, Ms. Lauren De Lorenzo. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, colleagues in government from Medford, the president of the Medford City Council, Mr. Bob Mayorko, and uh, Councilman Freddy uh, De La Russo. Uh, from the Somerville Board of Aldermen, uh, Rebecca Gewertz from Ward 6, Bill Roach from Ward 1, Alderman at Large, Bill White, um, Board of Aldermen President Marion Houston, and that I mentioned Representative Shortino. If I did, here's twice. There's two. You owe me one, Carl. <laughs> I think it's testimony when we actually had a, we were asked to host the event and trying to find a place that was um, transit friendly to reach. Sorry, this was the only spot. It's testimony how bad we need the extension through some of into Medford. But uh, <laughs> I also want to thank, and we're present tonight, uh, members, uh, our partners in this endeavor, not only everybody from the community, you're all our partners here in Somerville and Medford, but from STEP, Somerville Transportation Equity Partnership, thank you everybody for your advocacy and your partnership in this endeavor. Thank you, STEP. <laughs> you know, the investment of time and resources that the state has put into drafting and reviewing this document is truly an encouraging and exciting step forward. Uh, I am 100% committed uh, like many of you, to supporting the extension of the Somerville Green Line, again, through Somerville into Medford. And I'm excited to see all of you here to share your thoughts and comments on the specifics of this document. Now, we've come a long way, but we've got miles to go, literally. I want to firmly stress to the state officials here that we, as a community, are united and committed to this project. I also want to communicate to everyone our commitment to the formation of a citizen advisory committee. We're going to oversee a mix of stakeholders from Somerville and Medford that will play an engaged and important role in this process. I have just a few specific concerns that I think some of you here share with me. And I won't go into too much detail, but for the record, I want to stress the importance of the following. The current DEP SIP language may allow for delay in this project until 2014 and may enable other substitute transit improvement projects in lieu of the Green Line. I'm aware that the Commonwealth is reviewing this language to submit to the federal EPA, and would like to state it is the City of Somerville's position to support language that will maintain a completion date in the year 2011 for full implementation and will keep the Green Line extension a top priority. The, the, the single environmental impact review, and we are going to have a test in the amount of acronyms and the amount of times those acronyms are stated tonight here, <laughs> must include a full investigation of alternatives specifically land use, urban design, and transportation infrastructure along the corridor should be analyzed. In this document, the Green Line extension into Medford ends at the Medford Hillside stop. Although where the line terminates in Medford is certainly a decision that should be made by the City of Medford and its residents and stakeholders, I do believe recommendations that the terminus be south of Route 16 and a commercial zone would be beneficial to both Medford and Somerville residents. <laughs> 
Terminating this line at Route 16 grants access to the entire Somerville neighborhoods and will be a major asset for our city as well as our Medford neighbors and the region. So I want to thank you very much for your time, whatever your position is. Thank you for the time for coming out here to speak on this. I encourage everyone here to submit further comments in writing to the EOEA and MEPA office. And thank you all for showing your support for this absolutely crucial project, not just for these two neighboring communities, for the entire region. Thank you. Hello. Uh, my name is David Moeller. I am with the Executive Office of Transportation. I am the Executive Director of the Office of Transportation Planning. My phone number is 617-973-7844. My last name is spelled Moeller, M-O-H-L-E-R. My email is david.moeller at eot.state.ma.us. Um, we're here today, obviously, to talk about the Green Line and the Environmental Notification Form. If you do not have one, it is available totally downloadable, the whole thing, on our webpage. That is mass.gov slash EOT. You can also contact my office, and we will send you one. Um, we can send it to you either on CD or hard copy or both. Um, let me set the stage before Jim Winsley with Trans Systems will actually go through the uh, PowerPoint presentation. As has been spoken about before here, this is a commitment under the state implementation plan. What that means is Massachusetts is legally obligated to construct the Green Line project. Um, currently, this project is, the, the commitment is to Ball Square. Um, there is an amendment out, there has been an amendment out to amend the SIP that would extend it to West Medford. Um, there's also, that, that, that SIP amendment is not final. I'm hopeful it will be final by the end of November, if not sooner, certainly by December. Um, we are going to build this project. The question is how and where. Um, one of the reasons we've asked for a single EIR is because we all agree that the alternative is Green Line. It's not buses. It's not bus rapid transit. It's extending the Green Line. Um, obviously, we've gotten things wrong. We always do. That's why we're here tonight, so that people can tell us what we got wrong, what we got right, how we should change this, whether indeed a single EIR is appropriate. Um, I should note that we are on a Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. Excuse me. I should note that we are on a very aggressive schedule. Um, I know the mayor said he'd like to see, he expects to see 2011. Um, most transit projects take in this country anywhere from 13 to 20 years. Um, we are currently planning to have this one done within the next eight years. Um, hopefully that is achievable. We believe it's achievable. That will be that. Oh, wait, I need this. This I need. This is the that I don't need. Okay. Just make sure it's working. Yeah. Dr. Wood, can you hear me still? Now? Now? Excuse me for a second. Can you hear me now, Dr. Wood? Okay. Excuse me, this is an assisted listening device for a um, member of the audience. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. Um, anyway, so what we'd like is obviously for you to tell us what you'd like to see, um, what you expect to see. We will be out much more often into the neighborhood and into the communities. Um, this really is the beginning of the public process. If indeed we get, a, well, not if, when we get a scope from MEPA, we will go to drafting an RFR, request for responses, I'm sorry, to hire a consultant. This study will probably cost <laughs> us somewhere in the neighborhood of two to two and a half million dollars. Um, it will take us probably six months to get a consultant chosen and on contract. So sometime in the spring, we will actually begin this process and begin a much more robust public process. But please do let us know all your comments. And um, on that, I'll turn it over to Jim Winsley. Okay, thanks, David. Everybody hear me all right here? Okay. 
move it in closer to your mouth. All right. Try to move it. Just... All right. How's this? Okay. All right. Um, okay, we have our uh, little presentation here that uh, I will go through. It, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the the history of the project. Spend a little bit of time describing. Okay. All right. I'll spend a little bit of time uh, explaining the history of the project. Uh, tell you a bit of what the project all, is all about, and talk a little bit about the environmental impacts before uh, finally getting to the schedule and then getting uh, your chance to. Uh, provide comments. So if we can go to the first slide. Um, j just uh, in case you're not familiar with where it is, it's not a great map here, but this shows what, what the project area is. Uh, the project begins down at Leachmere Station. This would be the relocated Leachmere Station. Uh, the relocation of Leachmere Station is a separate project from this. This project assumes that that new station is in place. The project includes one long branch of the Green Line, all the way up through Somerville and Medford, up to but not crossing the Mystic River. And then a second branch, a short spur over to Union Square in Somerville. Okay. The purpose of this project, as it's been defined in previous studies, is to implement enhancements to transit services for residents of the communities of Somerville, Medford, and Cambridge. Uh, in improving corridor mobility and regional access, boosting transit ridership, improving regional air quality, ensuring equitable distribution of transit services and supporting opportunities for smart growth initiatives and sustainable development. The history of this project is that there have been numerous studies over the years about this corridor. All right, that works a little better. Um, there have been numerous studies. The most recent one was the Beyond Leachmere Northwest Corridor study, which was completed uh, just uh, about a year ago in 2005. That project included uh, some extensive stakeholder involvement, a public process. Uh, it looked at nine different alternatives for the corridor. These included combinations of the Green Line, commuter rail, and bus alternatives, such as bus rapid transit, an actual busway on the rail right of way. That study uh, considered not those nine different alternatives, which are listed uh, up here on the screen. There was a two-phase uh, screening process during that study. Those nine alternatives were narrowed down to the four that you see highlighted in, in bold and underlined on the screen here. And those four alternatives were then subject to further evaluation. Um, those four alternatives plus uh, another bus-only alternative that we call them the transit systems, uh, transportation systems management alternative, which is basically the best alternative you could do without building a new rail line. It's used for comparison purposes. So those five alternatives were considered. Okay. That study did not result in a recommendation for a preferred alternative. It just evaluated uh, those alternatives. Now, subsequently, uh, as David Muller mentioned, uh, as part of the uh, the state implementation plan for air quality, there is a commitment by the state to build a green line extension. As David mentioned, the current SIP says an extension to Ball Square. There is an amendment in process that describes the project that I'm going to be describing here tonight, essentially the two branches um, of the green line through Somerville and Medford. Okay. There's also been uh, numerous public comments over the years, and we heard the mayor's support that uh, there's uh, very substantial public support for this process. And because of that, uh, EOT, the Executive Office of Transportation, is moving forward with the Green Line extension as the preferred alternative. That is why EOT has requested to do what uh, Deidre described as a single EIR, a single environmental impact report, skipping the stage of going from doing a draft and final because there is consensus on what the preferred alternative is. So when that single EIR or SEIR uh, process begins, it's going to be looking, if it begins, if it begins We're still determining whether or not it will. Okay. It's expected that it will begin, but if it begins, um, it's proposed that by EOT that there would be just two alternatives, a no action alternative, doing nothing you know, for comparison purposes, and the Green Line extension that, that I'm going to describe here tonight. The other alternatives have been looked at in the past, 
it's proposed that those are off the table, that this is the preferred alternative that will be examined, and therefore there is that single EIR. Okay, now I'm going to describe a little bit about the, the project itself. Um, the project involves extending the green line along commuter rail lines through Somerville and Medford. Uh, the, the longer line that you saw in that first figure would be an extension on what is known as the Lowell commuter rail line. Um, goes through Somerville and Medford, the line would extend up from the relocated Leachmere station to Medford Hillside. In order to do that, uh, the existing commuter rail tracks would have to be moved just a few feet, but would have to be moved within that right-of-way to make room for the green line. So the project involves constructing new commuter rail tracks maybe 15 feet further over to one side to make room for the green line tracks. It would then involve uh, constructing two tracks for the green line parallel to that commuter rail line. So the right-of-way for that railroad line is wide enough to hold those four tracks for almost the entire length. There are just a few places that are mentioned up on the screen here where there are some tight spots that there have been some, in most cases, just parking lots built within the, the right-of-way that would have to be, uh, that would have to be taken to, to uh, get the right-of-way that's needed for uh, this alignment. The last item here, though, uh, that I want to point out is the, while the right-of-way is wide enough for those four tracks, uh, wherever there's a station, it needs to be wider because there has to be room for the station platform. And in those cases, there may be need for additional land, which would most likely be on the west side of the tracks, which would be the, the, uh, on, on the left if you're coming out from Boston. Okay. Along the second branch, along the Fitchburg line to Union Square, uh, the tracks would be located alongside the commuter rail tracks. Those commuter rail tracks would not have to be moved. There is space there on the north side of the tracks, which is the right side if you're coming out from Boston. There'd be two tracks for the green line built there. Um, the right-of-way is wide enough, except when you get into the Union Square area, you need some room to build a station, and the right-of-way is not wide enough for that right now, so there'd have to be some additional land involved to construct that station. Okay, throughout the entire uh, alignment of the project, there would have to be some additional elements other than the tracks that would have to be constructed. Uh, probably the major thing is the first thing here is that in many areas there are steep embankments along the side of the tracks. Those would have to be uh, cut back and retaining walls built in order to have room for the four tracks to fit through. So there'd have to be some extensive construction um, of retaining walls and, and fencing along the side of the right of way. There would also need to be a, a barrier built between the green line tracks and the commuter rail tracks. That's a Federal Railroad Administration requirement that if you have two different modes like the green line and the commuter rail, there has to be a concrete barrier between them. There would also need to be, because the green line is electrified, there would have to be overhead wires, the overhead catenary, and the supports that are needed to hold those wires up. And there would have to be electrical systems and power substations built along the, the right of way to, in order to provide the, the electricity to run those lines. And then finally, there would have to be signal and communication systems built along the line as well. Uh, that would be compatible with the green line. Okay, there would be a number of stations along the line. There would be at least six of them. Uh, the precise locations have not been determined yet, but uh, we know approximately where they would be. I'm going to switch to the, to the next slide to show you uh, exactly where they are. You can see here's a map of the line, and it would be one station on the Union Square branch, right in the vicinity of Union Square, and then on the Medford's Hillside line, There'd be a station near Washington Street, a station near Medford Street, Gilman Square, right out, right out behind us, right, right here. Uh, another station around Lowell Street, one near Ball Square, and one uh, near College Ave in Medford Hillside. And then there may be an additional station uh, on, on Winthrop Street, and EOT has, has stated that they will consider um, whether or not to include that station as part of this environmental review process. That, that, that will be looked at as an alternative. Okay, each of the stations will have certain facilities. There, it is not proposed that there will be any parking facilities at these stations. No parking structures, no parking lots. Uh, all the access to the station would either be by bus or people being dropped off. So there would have to be some, maybe some areas for buses to pull out or people to drop off passengers, but no parking facilities are proposed for any of these stations. 
Access down to the station platforms would be from the, the bridges. Most of those um, stations that were listed on the map are places where there are bridges over the tracks. So what would happen is there would be just a stairway and a ramp coming down from that bridge right onto the platform, which would be a center platform between the two green line tracks. So there'd be one platform with trains on both sides. The platforms would have the ticket vending machines that the MBTA is installing currently, but the fare payment would actually occur on board the Green Line train. If you want to think of something that this would be similar to, it would be like the Riverside Line on the Green Line. It, it wouldn't be closed-in stations, say, like the Orange Line. It would be more like the Riverside Line. Okay. And as I mentioned before, near the stations, in order to accommodate all this, there would have to be some widening of the right-of-way there. Now, there are uh, 15 bridges, 15 roads that cross over the two branches on the proposed Green Line extension. Some of these bridges um, are wide enough for four tracks to pass under, and some are not, and some we're not sure about. Um, the ones that we're not sure about are kind of pretty close, and because they're so close together, it's not clear that they even, they line up with each other, so that there's, there's some bridges that uh, we don't know whether they're adequate or not. But those that are listed as having inadequate clearance, that means it's not wide enough underneath for four tracks to fit through. That includes the Medford Street Bridge, right out behind us here tonight, the New Lowell Street Bridge, the Broadway Bridge <laughs> at Ball Square, and the, the Winthrop Street Bridge, and then on the Union Square line, um, the Prospect Street Bridge. Now the bridges at College Ave, Central Street, Sycamore School, and, and Walnut Streets may be wide enough that requires some further study to make sure that they can fit the four tracks underneath those bridges. And then the last five, uh, North Street, Cedar Street, Cross Street, and the two bridges uh, over each branch on the McGrath Highway, uh, those have plenty of room underneath and shouldn't require any modification. But the, the first category here would certainly require some reconstruction of those bridges. There are also three places where the uh, green line would pass over the street, three railroad bridges over the road. Uh, one of those is at Washington Street. That bridge is plenty wide enough. It's, uh, it's built for six tracks, but uh, that bridge is old and most of it is not being used now, and so there would need to be study to assess the condition of that bridge to determine whether that would have to be replaced because of its age. The other two cases, uh, Harvard Street on the, uh, the low Medford Hillside line and Medford Street uh, where Medford Street goes under the Fitchburg line near Union Square, uh, the, the bridge abutments, the supports for the bridge, are big enough to hold enough tracks, but the bridge itself uh, isn't wide enough that it just has to be some additional spans added to those bridges. The, the bridges that are, they now could stay, but there'd have to be something put alongside uh, parallel to those. Now the final piece of the, uh, of the project is a, uh, the storage and maintenance facility for Green Line vehicles. As part of the Leachman Station Relocation Project, the, that project is building uh, some storage tracks to store Green Line trains overnight um, in what we call the Yard 8 uh, area. Yard 8 is the section of the right-of-way just south of Washington Street, between Washington Street and the, uh, Leachmere, the new Leachmere Station. This project, the Green Line Extension, would have to expand on that facility in order to store the additional Green Line cars that would be needed to run this extension. And it's also proposed that in that area, the MBTA would build a new Green Line maintenance building. So there would be an actual new building at that location for the repair of Green Line vehicles, as well as overnight storage of those vehicles. Okay, now I'm going to uh, talk for a few minutes about what we think some of the environmental impacts might be of this proposed project. As Deidre mentioned, there are a few places where this project um, exceeds a threshold requiring an EIR. Um, those are the areas listed here, land, transportation, and uh, historical archaeological resources. And there are some other areas of impacts that I'll talk about as well. But in the area of land impacts, uh, this project would alter approximately 54 acres of land that is previously altered. It's all um, railroad right-of-way. It's, uh, it's you know, land that has been modified before. 
but the modifications here in most cases will be just putting in railroad tracks. Railroad tracks allow water to pass through them so there wouldn't be um, new, new surfaces that uh, would create runoff. The only new impervious surfaces would be the stations themselves. The station platforms um, would be paved and so that would be adding, that would be the only new pavement added by the project. There would be probably, you know, one or two new buildings associated with the maintenance facility. Those would occupy less than, less than two acres. That would be in that yard eight area. Uh, there would be land impacts in terms of um, stormwater runoff. There's already several areas where there's significant amount of water that gets into the right of way. And with the construction of the new retaining walls along the side of the right of way, particularly in the Medford Hillside area, that there would have to be um, some serious study of the um, stormwater issues and the runoff both at the top of the wall and within the right of way itself. In terms of transportation impacts, the biggest impact um, based on the previous Northwest, uh, Northwest Corridor study estimated that approximately 9,600 daily vehicle trips would be removed from the streets of Somerville and Medford. The project would the project would involve relocating about four miles of commuter rail track, as I mentioned, and about four and a half miles uh, of construction of new Green Line tracks. Uh, the extension of the Green Line would have some impact on Green Line operations. There would be more people using the Green Line, more people traveling into the Central Subway. There may not be actually more trains because existing trains would be extended up into Somerville, but there'd be more people um, going into the Central Subway and, and the impacts that that might have on Park Street Station or Government Center would have to be looked at uh, as part of the study. And also the extension of the line would put additional demands on the signal and power systems for the Green Line. So uh, there could be some impacts there and some, some needs to upgrade some of those systems. And, and uh, also another transportation impact that there is, there are places within the corridor that are used by freight railroads. Particularly, there's a freight connection from the area of Walnut Street down into and through the Yard 8 area where the maintenance facility would be. That freight track may need to be moved or some accommodation made uh, for that freight traffic. And also over on the Union Square branch, the, what's called the Grand Junction Railroad, it comes uh, up through Cambridge and into the yards in Charlestown. The, the way that is connected into the, the, uh, the rail yards in that area would have to be altered by this project and it would have to be some accommodation to allow that freight traffic to continue. Okay, some additional transportation impacts on the next slide here is there would be changes in the local bus network. Uh, right now most of the buses are oriented to bringing people into Leachmere Station. The buses would most likely be modified to be more oriented towards the Green Line stations. That could affect the way people travel uh, within Somerville and Medford. There would be no new roadways built as part of this project. There would be no new parking at the stations, just drop, just, just drop off areas at those stations. There would be some limited employee parking at the maintenance facility. That would be the only parking constructed as, as part of the project. There would be pedestrian and bicycle facilities at each of the stations, and that would include coordination with the Somerville Community Path Project, where those two projects intersect. Now, finally, in the area of uh, historical and archaeological resources, there's just one uh, historic structure that we've identified that is adjacent to the right-of-way. That's the Susan Russell House on Sycamore Street. Um, it's right next to where that Sycamore Street bridge is being reconstructed now. We don't expect there to be any impacts on that house, but there would be construction immediately adjacent to that property. So uh, we want to make sure that that was noted as a, a possible impact on a historical structure. Finally, some other possible impacts that are, are not involved in the, the thresholds for the environmental impact report. There are uh, several uh, parks and recreation facilities along the line. There are three that are immediately adjacent to the corridor. The Tufts Alumni Fields, the um, playground next to Trump Field and the Hoyt Sullivan Playground, which I think is on Central Street. Those are right up against the, the right-of-way. Uh, there are no wetlands 
that have been identified in the project area. However, there was this one area of some wetland vegetation in the area of Lowell Street that, that was noted during the observations that were made for this uh, environmental notification form. Um, some other possible impacts, there are numerous nearby underground storage tanks and hazardous materials site throughout Somerville. Uh, we do not believe there are any in the right of way, but uh, if any are identified, um, the EOT and MBTA will have to work with DEP to make sure that those, those are addressed. And then finally, uh, the bridge modifications that would have to be made, uh, several of those bridges include water and sewer lines uh, along them, and there would have to be accommodations made to maintain that service as those bridges are reconstructed. And finally, there are a couple of electrical substations that are uh, pretty much within the right of way um, that would, might, would need to be relocated. There's one right out behind the, the high school out here, and then there's another larger one in the Union. Okay, finally, in order to mitigate the impacts of some of these, uh, some of these items, that uh, there's a few things that, uh, that EOT and MBTA will have to do. Um, there needs to be some early consideration of station traffic management during the design of this project. Uh, with no new parking facilities there, there's going to, still going to be people using those stations and, and how those people um, can, how people can be dropped off at those stations and how buses are going to circulate through that area. That has to be built into the design of the stations and that will avoid any, uh, or at least try to avoid any local traffic impacts caused by the stations themselves. As I mentioned, there are impacts on freight railroad operations. Uh, EOT will have to work with uh, the two railroads involved to make sure that those operations are allowed to continue. Um, I mentioned on, on the hazardous sites that EOT and ABTA will have to work with DEP if any of those sites um, do have to be disturbed for this project. I mentioned also that a need for a stormwater management plan to deal with the drainage issues and runoff uh, created by the construction um, of those retaining walls. And then uh, also there needs to be a, a careful construction phasing plan with so many bridges impacted by, um, by this project and the, uh, the traffic that would be affected by that and the, and the utilities over those bridges that would be affected that needs to be a careful staging plan to uh, maintain traffic through Somerville and Medford as this is being constructed. And then finally, uh, there certainly needs to be coordination with the cities involved. EOT and MBTA will have to work with the cities of Somerville and Medford to make sure that all these uh, environmental impacts are dealt with. So finally, I just want to put the, the schedule for the project up here. And as David mentioned, uh, projects do take a long time to build. The state is committed to this project and moving forward with this. Uh, the first two items, the ex environmental notification form has been filed. The scoping session uh, is happening tonight. Um, as David mentioned, he expects notice to proceed on the, on the EIR in about six months, next May. Uh, those studies tend to take about 18 months, which would mean that they would be finished around November of 2008. Then uh, it takes about another two and a half years for final design. So, and, uh, and then construction would be able to begin in about the end of 2011. Uh, and then it would take about three years for construction and testing. So the, the date that the state is looking to, uh, at is December 2014 for completion of the project. So I think that's, that's all I have for the presentation. And uh, I'll turn it back to Deidre, I think. Thank you very much. OK, can everyone still hear me? Great. Um, I'm still Deidre Buckley with the MEPA office, for those of you who came in late. Um, that's the Massachusetts Environmental Policy Act. I try to say the acronyms, but I don't always remember. Hopefully I've said most of them tonight instead of just um, listing off acronyms. Um, but I am representing the Secretary of Environmental Affairs, and we are reviewing an expanded ENF environmental notification form for the Green Line Extension Project. We're now going to open up um, the meeting to public comments. I do want to remind you, because we have a large crowd tonight, we'd like to limit um, comments to about three mi minutes per person. Um, and I ask you to be respectful of people here who want to make comments. Um, some of us tend to go on a little longer, but just remember that 
you know, the person sitting next to you is taking time out from their job or their family or their favorite t TV show, um, and be respectful of that. I get paid to be here, so I can be here all night. But I know all of you are busy, so um, just remember that. Also, when you have the floor, you have the floor. Please be respectful of people. I like the energy in this room, but I also don't want people to get shouted down or um, you know, people to comment on what they're saying as they're saying it. So please be respectful and you know, let people have their say, whether you agree with it or not. And um, finally, I'll just raise my hand after about three minutes to give people a clue that it's about time to wrap up. Um, we're going to start by giving our elected officials an opportunity to make comments um, on behalf of their constituents, and then we'll go into the um, comment list. Again, if you didn't get your name on the sign-up sign sheet to comment, um, don't worry about it. Raise your hand as we get towards the end of the process, and we'll make sure that you have an opportunity to provide your comments. So to start off, I'd ask um, Senator Patricia Jalian is here, and she wants to provide some comments. Welcome. Oh, okay. Cool. Thank you. Thank you very much for having us here tonight again at Somerville High School. Uh, this is the beginning of the next phase, and many of us have been waiting and working for a long time to see this start. We're happy to see the progress. It's not on time, uh, as the mayor noted, but we're at least on track. I, I am going to be very brief because many people have things to say, and I think they'll be in, my remarks will be in concert with what others have to say. I have one concern about process and one about scope. The concern about process is that many people in Medford feel that they have been ignored in the planning for the Green Line. And I think it would be a sign to the people of Medford that their um, concerns are important if there would be um, another meeting, whatever you call it, uh, held by MEPA and EOT in Medford before November 9th so that people's concerns could be heard about the scope of the, of the EIR. The second is the concer our concerns, which we're supposed to ask tonight, about the scope of the project. And I would just say that it is premature to leave out and not to study uh, sites that have been considered and have significant public support. And those I would mention are people have talked about the possibility of a stop closer to Brick Bottom and Swin City, a stop. I'm sorry, could you repeat the second one? Well, it, it, you probably can't do both Washington Street and Brick okay. Bottom, Twin City, but Twin City. Okay, thanks. that and closer to the heart of Union Square. And the other is uh, the extension all the way to, but not across, Route 16. Um, and there, I think EOT very clearly heard from the people of Medford that there were at least divided opinions about going to West Medford Square, but they uh, they uh, overheard, they, they extended that concern farther than I think was necessary. And I think that both the benefits and the negatives of, of an extension to Route 16 are worth studying. So I just ask you not to, to cut off consideration of those stops before the start of this process. So thank you very much, and I'm thank looking you. forward to hearing their other comments. Thank you. Representative Carl Scortino. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm very much going to echo what my good senator has already mentioned. Uh, we are looking forward to a potential for major investment in public transportation in our area. And we are fortunate at this point to have existing rail line with a right of way that can accommodate the Green Line extension, as well as being fortunate to have a state legal commitment to completing this project. We are also most fortunate to have, as we can see here in the room tonight, a large collection of engaged citizens willing to participate in a long process towards completion of this Green Line extension. But questions of station design, pedestrian and bicycle access, how problems of traffic and parking will be exacerbated or improved, and many other questions remain. And my underlying principle for evaluating this project going forward is this. How do we design the Green Line extension so that it brings the greatest benefit to the local residents while preserving the integrity and character of the existing neighborhoods? If done right, this project has amazing potential to help existing residents it is critical that we have an active and engaged community process going forward. 
But in order to be done right, we need to make sure, as Senator Jalen has said, that Medford is fully engaged in this project going forward. And to that end, I want to echo her request for a second meeting in Medford before November 9th, whether hosted by MEPA or by EOT. In the long term, it also requires that citizens be actively engaged, possibly through a citizen advisory committee. It may mean doing walking tours in the neighborhoods to show residents how design options may look and feel. It will be crucial to have ongoing channels of communication between the planning agencies, the impacted neighborhoods, and local elected officials in both Medford and Somerville. I also want to address, as the Senator has, the crit critically important question of the terminus of the line. The EENF lists the intersection of College and Boston Ave as the terminus, but I do believe that a terminus closer to Route 16 would be a more appropriate endpoint. A group of residents came together from Medford and formed a group called the Medford Green Line Neighborhood Alliance. They have put forward a report of pros and cons at potential station locations, including a terminus close to Route 16 and a single stop between Winthrop and College and Boston Ave, as opposed to the two at Winthrop and College and Boston Ave. I believe this proposal has strong merit, but, also, but unless the scope is expanded to include the possibility of extending the study out to Route 16, that potential will be lost. So in closing, I'd like to say I'm very excited about this project going forward. I'm excited to see the community input beginning now, and I hope that we can reach farther out into Medford for better community dialogue, and I look forward to your comments back to us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> Representative Jim Marzilli. Good evening. Thank you for opening up these doors to us. Um, I'll be brief in my comments because I'll be submitting written commentary later on this week. Um, I do want to acknowledge that while it's important for the people of Somerville to be involved in this process, that the involvement, the attempts to involve the Medford community have been woefully lacking throughout this process. And I think it's imperative that you make a stronger effort to talk to the people who will both reap the benefits and bear the burdens of any extension. And that does not mean simply having meetings here in Somerville. Uh, this is a project that's going to be paid for by the people of the Commonwealth, Medford, and some of the surrounding communities. It, frankly, there just needs to be a better job of, of addressing those concerns. Um, I'm concerned also that the scope of the project in choosing a terminus point on or around Winthrop does not adequately allow you to examine the best options that are available for the expansion of, of the Green Line, the extension of the Green Line. There's a lot of comment, there's a lot of disagreement within the Medford community about where terminus points should be, where, where stations should be. We need to have a scope of project that is defined in such a way that allows you to study all of the options and to involve the people, again, who will be bearing the burdens of having the, these stations placed in their communities. The effort here should be to make sure that the Green Line extension enhances the quality of life everywhere it goes and that it does not diminish the quality of life. We need to have input from the people who are going to be in the adjoining areas so that they can be certain that their neighborhoods are not going to be disrupted by additional traffic, that parking concerns will be dealt with. I should add quickly here that I'm glad to see once again that you have indicated that there will be no parking structures built in conjunction with this. I think that's an important step to note here. But the, it's so hard to separate the two issues of community input and final design, because until you have the full community input from Somerville and Medford residents, you will not be able to make the determinations about the best, the optimal placements of the stations. So I would encourage you to expand the scope, to consider going out to Route 16, but not across 16, and to do a better job in particular of involving the people, not just along the Medford stretch that goes up to Route 16, but also into the rest of the community of Medford, because they are part of this process. Again, I'll be submitting written testimony uh, shortly this week. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. <laughs> Lauren DiLorenzo, I believe, is representing the mayor of Medford. Thank you. I'm Lauren DiLorenzo. Can you hear me okay? Director of Director of Community Development for the City of Medford, and uh, give uh, you Mayor McGlynn's apologies. He, had, he chairs the school committee and had to attend that meeting tonight, and he's not able to be here. However, he did want me to express what I, I think 
I, has, I hope has gotten clearly across is that the mayor is in support of improvements to public transportation in Medford. He is committed, though, to making sure that any major public improvements project, and those include the ones that we do in the city of Medford ourselves, don't impact neighborhoods and people in a negative way. So I thank you for listening to some of the comments that we have tonight to consider in the scope of this project. There's been an incredible flip-flopping of this project by the administration, and I mean the government, uh, the, the, um, basically the governor's office, quite honestly, over the past year. And, um, you know, first it was the project isn't going to go, then it was a substitution to the project, and then all of a sudden it was an emergency. And we heard about a week and a half ago that this was going to happen. And really, um, when people talk about a meeting in Medford, including Medford residents, we're, we're not, it's not a meeting, really. What I think the, the crux of the problem here is that you have a very active and engaged group of people who understand the benefits of public transportation and will probably use it. But then you also have an older population in the city who have lived there for years and probably will not use it, quite honestly, and are very concerned. They, most of them don't really understand what this project is because they didn't think it was ever really going to happen. They don't know where these stations really are. And many of them have not had the wherewithal to attend the public hearings that have happened to date, which have really been around the SIP. So I think that part of the environmental review process, if it's possible, should include really an identification of a public input strategy and how you will be able to reach out to people who don't normally attend public hearings like this. Because certainly, there are many more people than 500 that would be impacted by the project. Uh, specifically, um, the Northwest Corridor Study, which I was involved with on the advisory committee, the city did ask for a complete review of alternatives 1A and 1C, which did look at extending the project to West Medford. Um, there was some citizen comments, and it was something you know that we could anticipate based on previous work that we had done in West Medford with the MBTA, that the character of the West Medford business area would be very negatively affected by such an expansion. And it was also going to include the taking of private homes. And you would have to span the Mystic River. So because of those kind of general concerns, without it wasn't really fully studied, but because of those obvious general concerns, it was um, a neighborhood and really a city consensus that it didn't really make sense to go to West Medford, though there was not a full study to that. But this ENF basically changed the project area without any input from us. And we do think that uh, the full study should go to um, the point right by Mystic, um, Mystic River and Route 16, that that should be really the end point of the study area, and we're asking you to make sure that that happens. We also think that this should be a draft and a final, that we think that the time and process that's involved with that will ensure dialogue amongst people. And usually, honestly, in, sometimes we want to push forward an agenda that we have because we're in support of a project, but by building on the support, I think that it will make the project successful. And I think it's necessary for a project of this magnitude. It's important to understand who's going to be served by this. The MBTA study projected that 10,000 new riders would be on this line if it went to West Medford. The ENF here that you've prepared says that the ridership will be walk up and drop off. There's really a disconnect between the MBTA study and what you're proposing here. And I really don't believe it. So one of the things that we're asking for is that you really Access, traffic and parking um, effects, and while some people don't want a parking structure, there may be certain needs for that, and I don't know that you could say that there will not be any negative traffic and parking impacts with just walk-up ridership, because I don't think that's going to happen. We have some major intersections in Medford that should be studied. I think you've identified most of them. Several of these have been recently improved, so I don't know how you're going to get around that, but many of these intersections also have bridges that lead into them. And this exacerbates the problem and really puts limitations on how, what kind of improvements can be done to improve capacity in those areas. But we're most um, concerned with Harvard, Harvard Street and uh, Boston Avenue, and we're concerned about the pedestrian use at St. Clement's Church and School, which is right adjacent to that. We are also concerned with Boston College Avenue. We've proposed a station in that area, though we don't know exactly where that is. It seems that to me that that would be Tight. It's a five-legged intersection. The bridge leads directly into it. There are already geometric problems with that, so we're concerned about that. Winthrop Street and Boston Avenue is a, um, it's an undersized sig signal as it is now. And again, if you have a station there, I, I, we're concerned about the impacts to the, to the whole intersection. And um, we also believe you've mentioned that there are several bridge improvements that are possibly 
Well, you didn't mention bridge improvements. You did mention that uh, bridges would have to be studied, but I think the end result will be that there'll be several bridge improvements that will have to be done. And we're concerned about those North Street, Boston College Avenue, which was Boston uh, College Avenue, which was just recently reconstructed. All of these uh, bridges in Medford should be looked at. We're concerned about bus users. There are many people who use the bus as a re regular mode of transportation. They're concerned about their routes being eliminated, so we feel that you should fully identify what impacts it will be to existing bus routes and um, bus service. And uh, pedestrian bicycle access. We would like you to fully study what that pedestrian bike bicycle access will be. And uh, generally, the other things that you've identified, the stormwater drainage, we're concerned in particularly over at Harvard Street and Boston Avenue. We have an existing storm drain problem there when there is flooding and major events, and uh, we think this is a little exacerbated. The uh, study should also look at um, any private properties that we've taken for embankments, et cetera. So that's generally our comments. We are in support of an extension to um, the Green Line, but we do feel that uh, citizens of Medford should be in included in the process. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Lauren. Okay, next I'll introduce the um, City Council President in Medford, Bob Maiko. Is that correct? Try again, Mayako. Mayako, okay. That's why you should come to Medford. <laughs> <laughs> right? Have come to Medford. Well, that's about the nicest invitation I've ever gotten. <laughs> Cordially welcome all the time. And please, I concur wholeheartedly with the OCD Director for Medford, Lauren D. Lorenzo. And I'm heartened what I heard from my Senator Jalen and Representative Marzilli and Sorrentino. Let me say bluntly, there is a small percentage of Medford residents in this area, and I commend the group that has put together this, Kenny Krause and his group in Medford that have put together this proposal that I think you should take under a serious advisement. But the vast majority of the people in Medford do not have a clue on this project that I represent, and myself with Fred Delarusso that is here tonight. Come to Medford, and I don't know why November 9th, that's an election date. I mean, if, if, the sooner the better. We meet on Tuesday nights in Medford, the Medford City Council. I will give a report on this tomorrow night, along with Councilor Fred De La Russo. But let me urge you, I, mean, I, haven't, I haven't heard anything about costs. We're assessed $3 million by the MBTA in Medford. How much more is that going to be? What is the cost of this project? Hundreds and millions of dollars of an agency that's drowning in debt. And I'm a supporter of public transportation. I take the 326 bus into my office every day from Medford. So there's no stronger proponent of public uh, transportation in Medford than I am. But come to Medford. It's great to have meetings in Somerville, but it's better to have it in Medford because we're going to be impacted just as much as Somerville is. So don't stop tonight. And please, Make it a point, gentlemen, ladies, to come to Medford. You can come to a Medford City Council meeting. I will leave my card. 